For the last few days, I have been testing the brand new M2 Max Mac Studio. The Mac Studio I have here has the 12 core M2 Max chip in it. That's eight performance cores and four efficiency cores. It also has a 38 core GPU and 96 gigabytes of memory. This thing is a beast. Now I'm calling this video a first look because I am filming this video on Sunday. I just got my hands on the Mac Studio on Thursday and this video has to go up on Monday. So I haven't had a ton of time to spend with it, but I've done a bit of testing. So I wanted to make a video. I wanna do some more testing, especially stuff outside of my workflow, but there just wasn't enough time to do that. Uh, but I'm gonna do a full review later on. Of course, the first thing I tested was editing videos. Now, I know when YouTubers talk about editing videos as a benchmark for computers, people tend to roll their eyes. And the reason why we do that is because editing video, especially like 4K video, is a good stress test, like a good real world stress test of computers. But more accurately now, it used to be a stress test. I took some projects that I've had, some old projects, some current projects, uh, some stuff I've edited on the iPad, brought them all onto this machine, and none of those projects could make the Mac Studio sweat at all. At no point was I maxing out CPU or GPU performance or running out of memory. I, there was nothing I could do in my video editing workflow that could even cause the Mac Studio to break a sweat. Now, every single project I use to test on this machine is all 4K footage, nothing 1080p, everything was 4K. Some of the stuff was H.264, most of it was H.265. 95% of all the footage that was in these projects was shot on the Canon R5, which uh, is not an easy codec. Like it, it's, it's a beefy, beefy, beefy camera. In fact, when it originally came out, it was causing uh, the Intel Mac Pros at the time to crash. Like it was, it was a heavy beast. The Mac Studio handled it like a champ. And all of this stuff that I shot on the R5 was the highest quality possible settings other than using 8K, I'd never shoot 8K with my R5 because it's just not realistic. Now the rest of the stuff was iPhone footage and iPhone footage is H.265, meaning it's more compressed. The computer has to do more work for the encoding and decoding of all that stuff. Couldn't, couldn't touch it. And honestly, I think that really has to do with the media engine that is built into the M series chips. For those that don't know, the, there's a media engine built into uh, the M series chips that handles things like HEVC video, H.264, H.265, ProRes, all those video formats. And it really helps the CPU and GPU just handle all this stuff more efficiently and incredibly fast. So for example, I took a 13 minute and 59 second video. This is the interview video I did in WWDC. Uh, this is some shot on iPhone footage, some shot on Canon R5 footage. There's some multi-cam stuff in there. There's a uh, high frame rate 4K footage in here. It's like the most diverse project I had available to me. It was able to export this video in three minutes and 36 seconds. That's, that's wild. That's more than 10 minutes faster than real time, like playing it back. So nothing in my workflow, Final Cut, Lightroom, Photoshop, none of that stuff could cause the Mac Studio to break a sweat. It just handled everything like a champ. Now for my full review, I'm actually talking to a couple of friends that work in stuff like Maya and Nuke, and I'm trying to get some projects from them it's kind of hard because sometimes, you know, they have NDA stuff, but I am trying to get some projects from them that I can, you know, run on this Mac Studio. I, I'm just trying to get it to see if I can max out the CPU or GPU or memory because nothing I have in my workflow as a creative person can do that. For those that don't know, Maya is kind of like a 3D animation tool. It's used for a lot of like game stuff. And then Nuke is a lot is a compositing tool used for a lot of Hollywood movies and stuff like that. Like if you've ever seen a movie with any CGI in it, chances are it was done in Nuke. One complaint from a lot of reviewers and users of the original first generation Mac Studio was that you could hear the fan 
even when it was idle, like it just you always heard the fan no matter what load level it was under. I'm happy to report this is not the case for this new Mac Studio. I've had this thing sitting on my desk in the same position, just to the right of me when sitting at it, and at no point could I hear the fan, even when I was exporting 4K video from Final Cut. In fact, just to see if I could get the fans to kick on to an audible level, I started exporting a 4K video from Final Cut, opened up Lightroom, and started working in Photoshop, all while having my normal apps open, like Task Manager, Safari, Calendar, all of that stuff was just open in the background, and I couldn't hear the fans. Now, I know the fans are blowing because I can stick my hand underneath the Mac Studio and I can feel air blowing out of them, but to my ears, I cannot hear them. In fact, it was to the point where I was starting to question my own hearing, so I took my microphone, the microphone I'm talking into right Right now, it's just right here out of frame. That's why I pointed to it. I stuck it right next to the Mac Studio and I, I went back and listened to the recording and I still couldn't hear anything. So whatever they did to the thermals for this Mac Studio seemed to have fixed the issue from the first generation one. Now, I'm not saying you'll never hear the fan in the Mac Studio. I'm sure there are plenty of workflows out there that will get this fan spinning. Uh, one thing I really wish I still had, but I didn't save the project, was my iPad OS 16 walkthrough video. On my M1 Max MacBook Pro, the 14 inch model, that one really got the fan spinning when I was exporting it, and it actually crashed a couple of times because it ran out of memory. Uh, I, it had 64 gigs of RAM in that machine, and it was hitting 128 so 64 of the actual memory and then 64 of virtual memory and it was hitting that and it was crashing final cut eventually i got it to work through a series of weird things that don't matter but i wish i still had that project to test on this so i know my workflow can get fans to spin up on the m series chips but on this mac studio all the projects and all the work i threw at it couldn't get it to spin up. One of my favorite things about the Mac Studio is it has a ton of ports. And my favorite port that it has, 10 gigabit ethernet. So most desktop computers, if you were to go to Costco and buy one or something like that, have gigabit ethernet. But the Mac Studio has 10 gigabit ethernet. And why this is important is for people doing um, heavy workloads with, with large data off of servers and NASes. So I've talked on this channel before that I have a NAS and my NAS has 10 gigabit ethernet. So what I did was I plugged the Mac Studio straight into my 10 gigabit switch with, which is what my NAS is plugged into as well. And I was able to restore this Mac Studio from my time machine backup in like no time at all. I probably should have timed it just to see it, but I didn't really want to sit in here and like watch like a progress bar go. It took a little bit of time, but it wasn't like a day. It was an hour or two at the most. It's just stupid fast. In fact, I theoretically could be able to work right off my NAS because of the way I have it configured with this machine now. The Mac Studio also has four Thunderbolt ports on the back, which is really nice because I have two studio displays plugged into this. And it's honestly handling two 5K displays really well. Like there's no lag, no latency, no, no nothing. It, it works perfectly. There's also two USB-A ports, which is great if you need to plug in like a keyboard or a gaming mouse or something like that, where you just need those old legacy USB-A ports. HDMI, if you want to plug it into a TV or something like that. And then on the front of it, uh, for mine, because I have the M2 Max one, it has two USB-C ports. But if you get the M2 Ultra model, those USB-C ports are actually Thunderbolt ports, which is even better because if you have like Thunderbolt drives and stuff like that, you can just plug them into the front without having to reach around to the back. That was the one big annoyance is when I was moving stuff around from the iPad to the studio, I was using a Thunderbolt external hard drive to copy projects back and forth. And it was incredibly fast but i would just have to reach around to the mac studio and just the way it is it was just kind of annoying on my desk to kind of have to do that so m2 ultra would be nice because it has thunderbolt on the front there's also an sd card slot on the front uh, i use this for testing it's an sd card slot it works but i have my own little hub in my monitor stand that i use i played a couple of games on the mac studio and out of all of the games that are available for the mac 
Resident Evil Village is the newest AAA game that's probably the most graphics intensive, but it's still a two year old game. Now, I was able to get this to a stable 60 frames per second performance at a 2560 by 1440 uh, resolution. Now, I went in and I cranked up all the graphic settings and it looked great, despite the fact the studio display isn't HDR, which that was the biggest bummer because going from an HDR TV where I do play video games to that, like it looked a little more washed out, but studio display is not meant for gaming. The studio display is a 60 hertz refresh screen. I was able to get 60 frames per second consistently. That's perfect. Now the issue with gaming on the Mac isn't if the hardware can handle it because with Apple Silicon, it's very clear that it can handle it, but it's the fact that there just are no games to play on the Mac. Resident Evil Village uh, was a thing that was touted at last WWDC, the, the one in 2022. And there really hasn't been any uh, anything else. Uh, no Man's Sky came out um, a couple weeks ago, but I think that game's even from like 2018 or something like that. It's not a new game at all. I would never recommend to somebody that they get a Mac for the sole purpose of having it as a gaming machine. But that could change with the future Mac OS update, Sonoma. Uh, that's the next major macOS update that was announced at WWDC, and Apple built these really specific porting tools to allow developers to bring over the PC versions of their games with very little work. In fact, there are some users, not developers, users. They've already ported over Diablo 4, which is a brand new game, and it's running on it really well with very little work. I mean, this is the user level, not the developer level. So what I'm hoping this means is publishers are going to see this and go, hey, it looks like the Mac is a viable platform for us for our games to run on. It's not gonna take us a lot of work to get uh, our games ported from PC over to the Mac. Let's just go ahead and do it. And that way we can actually start to get you know, real AAA games that are coming out the same year as their PC counterpart and not having to wait two, three, four years for a Mac version to come around. Like I said, there was nothing in my workflow that could stump this machine. The, I, tr I tried everything that I do in a normal day. Uh, like I said, I haven't had a lot of time, so I didn't get to kind of push it with like projects like from Nuke or Maya or anything like that. I mostly just stuck to my workflow. And as a creator, I do have a pretty intensive workflow, but nothing can push it. So it's extremely clear to me that this is the best desktop Mac for people that need high-end computing needs. Of course, there's a larger elephant in the room in the shape of a Mac Pro, but you can spec a Mac Studio to meet a Mac Pro with the M2 Ultra chip. The only major difference between the Mac Pro and the Mac Studio at the, at the Ultra, if we're comparing apples to apples with the chips, is that the Mac Pro supports PCIe cards, except GPUs, so it supports like network cards and storage cards and things like that, and it has a few more Thunderbolt ports. Oh, and it has wheels. The, the Mac Pro also has wheels. So unless you really need those specific things, like unless you really need those wheels, the Mac Studio is, is perfect for you. The Mac Studio takes up a lot less space than the Mac Pro. In fact, one of the things that really impressed me when I first took it out of the box is I was actually able to take the Mac Studio and slide it underneath the Ugmonk Gather, that's the monitor stand that's on my desk, and it fit underneath there, no problem. It was a really nice surprise. Now, I did end up using it as a monitor stand because the review studio display that I have here is just a tilt one. It's not a tilt and height adjustable one like the one I have, the one I bought. Uh, I need that height adjustable because I'm 6'1". Just a little side tangent. Normally, I don't like working from two monitors, but I had both of them here. I'm gonna use them. And it's been interesting having a main monitor to work from and then like uh, another monitor that I've been using as my reference monitor. Like I've been keeping my task manager and calendar and discord and messages and stuff over there. I really wish the studio display though had a, the ability to rotate it on the stands. Having 
two horizontal ones just makes it this really wide area. In fact, it's so wide that if I stuck my hand out from where I'm sitting at my desk, it's wider than where how long my arm reach is. So having a vertical one would have been killer, especially for apps like Messages and Ivory and Discord and stuff that benefit from big vertical windows. But again, the Mac Studio had no issues driving two 5K displays. So for me and people that are kind of like me that can have heavy computing workflows, I see the Mac Studio and the Mac Mini as great machines to complement an iPad workflow. I'm gonna do a whole video on this setup and this concept, but the iPad Pro, this guy right here, is my main computer. When I sit down to do work, this is where I'm doing it. But every once in a while, I have big projects that I need to work on. Uh, I referenced my iPad OS 16 walkthrough video. Um, that video alone had over a terabyte of footage. Now the iPad Pro only goes up to two terabytes of footage. The Mac Studio can go up to eight. I have the four terabyte one here. So you get a lot more space options with these. Uh, but also it, when you have a project that big with that many clips and stuff like that, it you really do need a more powerful machine than the base series M chip, even in the iPad or something like the MacBook Air. The other thing that I really like the Mac Studio for, and, and this would apply to the Mac Mini as well, because they're headless machines, meaning they are computers that don't have a monitor built into them, something like a laptop or an iMac, you can just run them on, you don't have to have a, a monitor plugged into them. Uh, they're great for being always on automation machine. This is perfect for managing files and data and all sorts of really little things that I just don't want to have to manage myself. So I built automations to handle that. If you're looking for a powerhouse of a machine that doesn't take up a lot of space and you don't need PCIe slots, this is it for you. For most creators and developers, the M2 Max should be the starting default machine to look at. The reason why I still recommend an M2 Max Mac Studio over something like the M2 Pro Mac Mini is because you want that extra headroom. You don't wanna spend thousands of dollars on a computer and start working on a project and realize this thing isn't powerful enough. If you spec out an M2 Pro Mac Mini with 32 gigs of RAM and one one terabyte of storage and then go to the Mac Studio and spec out a 32 gigs of RAM, one terabyte of storage, M2 Max Mac Studio, there's only a $200 difference between the two. And with the Mac Studio, you get the benefit of having a faster CPU and GPU, along with the ability to upgrade that even further if you wish with up to eight terabytes of storage and 96 gigs of RAM. That's just really helps for exporting and building those larger projects. While having that extra flexibility, while not having a major price jump is huge for creators. Now I haven't used the M2 Ultra machine. I did get to see a demo of it at WWDC and it's extremely impressive, especially for really specific niches uh, like those Maya and Nuke workflows that I was talking about. But I honestly think for, for most creators, for the people that are watching this video that are like, okay, I, I wanna be a YouTuber or an independent filmmaker. I wanna work on documentary stuff or I wanna do like big graphic design work. I wanna do large development development stuff, the M2 Max is, is the perfect spot for you. Overall, I'm extremely impressed with this machine, even with the limited amount of time I've had with it. I'm gonna do a full review on it in a couple of weeks, along with a couple of other videos around it, especially that one that I mentioned about how it can complement an iPad workflow. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions about the Mac Studio, put them in the comments below. Have a great day.